well dear students this is the 21st lecture in the series of mechanics of metal forming if you recall back uh, in the 20th lecture we started with the concept of slip line theory and uh, if you recall then we we derived the equilibrium uh, starting with the equilibrium equation and uh, the alpha beta line then they explained that where the maximum shear stresses lines of maximum shear stresses and then uh, we proceeded with uh, hankey's equation and uh, if you recall the figure number 4 where the velocity component then uh, if it is proposed uh, as v alpha and v beta along alpha and beta lines and then we proceeded towards the velocity equations so let us start with uh, the last lecture so we uh, the velocity equations uh, if you recall equation number uh, 15 where the pair of alpha beta line with velocity component Uh, v alpha and v beta was considered and uh, after resolving those and along the alpha and beta lines along x and y axis we proceeded and uh, then you recall the equation number 16 17 18 and uh, then uh, if you remember the hankey's first theorem so if let us see this particular figure 5 uh, where the Uh, hankey's first theorem we call and uh, that means along the alpha line and uh, if you calculate uh, if we take this uh, set of uh, alpha beta line and which is forming a uh, a kind of parallelogram not exactly but it's a curvilinear lines parallelogram so if you look here the point a b and c as d so at a the alpha line where uh, a to b across and then b to c is beta line and then c to d it is again alpha line and from d to a it is the beta line so if you recall the angle at a if it is taken as psi a at b it is psi b from horizontal and at c and d that is psi c and psi d is taken up so if you take the tangent along the alpha line that is at point a and d if it is taken so it will meet at a point which is shown here in figure 5 so uh, now this in between the angle of the tangent at point a and d will be given as psi a minus psi d and similarly if we do it for the uh, along the beta line that is at uh, point b and c so the the if you draw the tangent at point c and uh, d b along beta lines so we have the included angle as psi b minus psi c so this is what implies the uh, uh, hankey's first theorem so uh, if we see that then one can write that the long alpha line uh, deva v by deva x minus uh, 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 v beta deva uh, psi by deva uh, x is equal to 0 which is a long alpha line and uh, then deva uh, v by beta Uh, deva v beta uh, and deva y plus uh, v alpha 
deva phi by deva y is equal to 0 along beta line that is obvious. One can also write down this, this set of two equation uh, which is in 19 uh, that is uh, d v alpha minus uh, v beta d phi is equal to 0 along alpha line and d v beta plus uh, v alpha d uh, psi is equal to 0 along a beta line. These uh, velocity equations in fact are called as uh, Zeringer's equation as said earlier and are essentially statements of the fact that there is a zero extension or contraction along a alpha line. So, uh, starting with the Henke's first theorem that means uh, this particular uh, Henke's first theorem demonstrate an important property of slip line and uh, is very very useful in constructing slip line fields. The theorem states that if you recall back equation number uh, uh, figure number 5 where the we constructed the uh, network of these alpha and beta lines for one particular curvilinear, curvilinear set of lines. So, and uh, the, the you just explain the angle between their tangents that meets at a point. So, with respect to this, uh, the theorem states that the angle between two slip lines of the same family, say for an example alpha uh, family line where uh, they are cut by a slip line of the other family for an example beta family uh, is constant along their length. Referring to this figure 5 again that you, want, you if you look it into the, the, the two slip line of alpha family are cut by a slip line of beta family at A and D while the second slip line of beta family cut the same two slip line of alpha family at B and C. So, uh, that follows from the theorem that uh, angle psi A minus psi D and angle psi B minus psi C are equal. This can be in fact proved by applying the relevant stress equations along slip lines. So, uh, let us see uh, if you move from uh, point A to B along alpha line, one can write down uh, uh, the, the stress equation that is P A plus twice K psi A and that is equal to P B plus uh, twice K psi B or it can also be written as P A is equal to P B minus twice K psi A minus psi B and uh, if we move similarly from B to C along beta line, one can simply write that P B minus twice K psi B and which is equal to P C minus twice K psi C or alternatively it can be written as P C which is equal to P B minus twice K and uh, psi B minus psi C. So, from these uh, equations that is which is given in 22 and 24 P C minus P A and uh, that is equal to twice K psi A minus twice psi B plus psi C and that is what is given here in equation number 25. And uh, similarly, uh, if you move uh, across uh, from A to D uh, along beta line and from D to C along alpha line one can also write down that is P A minus twice K psi A is equal to P D minus twice K psi D. Alternatively it can be written as shown in equation 27 that is P A is equal to P D plus twice K psi A. Uh, psi A minus uh, psi D and uh, 
similarly pd plus twice k psi d is equal to pc plus twice k psi d and therefore it can be written as shown in 29 that is pc is equal to pd minus twice k psi c minus psi d. So, if you use equation number 27 and 29 one can write down that pc minus pa becomes equal to minus twice k psi a minus twice psi d plus psi c and uh, if we uh, if you again use uh, equation number 25 and 30 all together. So, one can get on the left side as psi a minus twice psi b plus psi c and that should be equal to on the right hand side that is minus psi a minus twice psi d plus psi c. And uh, if you bring those other terms on the other side, so one can then simply write down that psi a minus psi d and that is equal to psi b minus psi c. And this is what is shown here in equation 31. So, uh, this has been from Hanke's first theorem. The second theorem to see the second theorem, let us see figure number 6 here, which represent the second theorem. So, uh, let us consider again the network, uh, which was shown as he uh, in figure 5. So, if we see here uh, at the point A, B, C and D across the curvilinear set of lines alpha and beta. And uh, let us now uh, take the tangent at all the points that is A, B, C, D. So, if we take the tangent at point A that meets uh, that is at O across uh, alpha and beta lines. So, uh, that is the we get the uh, uh, across uh, this particular construction and let us take the radius from like this figure where at a you have you get at and from a and d that is across alpha line the tangents meet at o b and similarly uh, at b and uh, c if we take it meets at o b dash that is across the beta line. Similarly, on the uh, across the alpha line it is termed as O alpha and O dash alpha and the included angle has been shown. For an example, uh, O beta and O dash beta the included angle has been shown here as uh, uh, D uh, psi beta and uh, D psi beta that are all, all same from the Henke's first theorem. And let us take the radius uh, that is from A to O B that is R beta and uh, uh, therefore, and from C to uh, D that is taken as R beta plus D R beta. So, note down these all angle which is here again here the R alpha is the radius from A to uh, alpha uh, O alpha and similarly here. So, with respect to this the second Henke's second equation. Uh, uh, this uh, with respect to the small uh, section, uh, the corresponding radii that we say uh, 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 at C would be uh, R alpha plus D uh, R alpha and uh, R beta plus D R alpha and therefore, one can write down that A B so, A B becomes equal to uh, your uh, uh, D S alpha that is the segment of that is A B is the segment along the alpha line and that is what is equal to uh, R alpha and D sin alpha uh, psi alpha. Similarly, the A D is uh, D s beta and that is equal to r beta uh, multiplied by minus d psi beta. C d similarly 
can be written as uh, R A minus D S beta multiplied by D psi A alpha and that is equal to uh, R alpha plus D uh, R alpha and whole multiplied by D uh, psi alpha. And similarly, the B C is uh, R B minus D S alpha and multiplied by minus d sin beta, uh, psi beta and that is again equal to uh, r beta plus d r beta multiplied by minus d psi beta. That is what is being shown here in equation 32. So, the above equations give that is from 32 one can then uh, put it on the transport side and one can get that 1 by r alpha is equal to d uh, psi alpha divided by d s alpha and 1 by r beta which is equal to minus d psi beta divided by d s beta and then d r alpha and d r beta can also be written as shown in uh, equation number 33. So, the the 33 equation number 32 the values of a b is a c and all these things evaluated with respect to figure number 6. So, and then uh, it, it is evaluated as d r alpha and r d r beta. Uh, as far as the sign convention is used for the radii of the curvature shown here, we take say the r alpha if we take that is this is taken as uh, which is shown here in uh, figure number 7 to illustrate the sign convention. It is taken as positive it is if it is here and this along the beta if it is this way it is taken as positive otherwise it is negative on the other side. So, uh, then we have uh, d r beta plus uh, r alpha multiplied by d sin uh, psi alpha and it is which is equal to 0 along alpha line and uh, therefore, d r alpha minus r beta d psi, uh, psi beta is equal to again 0 along a beta line. So, these equations as I said are known as Hanke's second theorem when we introduce the radius of curvature. And uh, it simply state that uh, the radius of curvature of a uh, slip line decreases by an amount which is equal to uh, the distance traveled along the other slip line of the same family. So, if you see figure number 6 both r alpha and r uh, beta have this uh, have been shown in positive sense. The usual convention is to take the radius of curvature of a slip line to be positive when the center of curvature lies in the direction in which we are traveling along the other slip line uh, as shown here uh, as, uh, in figure 7 which is the positive side and negative um, side these sense would be taken into consideration. Uh, if you look at a point P on line of the velocity discontinuity which is shown here in figure number uh, 8. So, if you see this is what is the uh, this is the line of velocity discontinuity if you look here. So, in fact, a slip line can also be a line of discontinuity velocity discontinuity. So, uh, when we take uh, when we consider a velocity discontinuity uh, line then on one side of the velocity discontinuity line one can say uh, take as a reason A and, and on other side one can take it as the reason B. So, if, if uh, let us take a point uh, on this particular figure 8 uh, p on the line of discontinuity. So, 
when deformation of the material take place and when it is just below the line of uh, uh, velocity discontinuity that is uh, within reason A. So, say let us uh, it is at the point P A, uh, its velocity component then can be written as uh, V x and V y along the tangential and normal directions. And in a similar manner, uh, let us take a point B, which is in region B, and uh, that the point is say at PB, that is just above the velocity discontinuity, and therefore its corresponding points can be written as uh, uh, velocity component can be written as uh, Vx prime and Vy prime. It is obvious that. Uh, Vy prime must be equal to Vy uh, since uh, in a uniformly deforming material there can neither be cavity formation and nor there must be any peeling up of material. Uh, and therefore, uh, there is uh, however, no such restriction along the tangential direction and velocity discontinuity of the amount therefore, Vx minus Vx prime is possible. It is useful to consider the line of uh, velocity discontinuity as a narrow band of real material across which material varies and uh, uh, material velocity varies very rapidly. Though uh, in a continuous matter uh, as uh, if you look at figure 5, uh, uh, when the band uh, uh, approaches to 0 value, the shear uh, rate in the layer which is uh, in the subsequent layer, it approaches infinity. Such a discontinuity uh, in the tangential velocity uh, leads to an infinitely large rate of shear strain uh, that can occur uh, only along direction of maximum shear stress that is along a slip line. Thus, a line of velocity discontinuity has to be a slip line that is the uh, uh, very important thing that slip line and that is how the name appeared as slip line where the line of discontinuity would continue. So, that this line that means this very concept uh, one can if you keep in your mind it will help you a lot to understand the theory of slip line. So, this velocity discontinuity start the which is a point P on velocity discontinuity line which is in fact a slip line. So, that is of interest and when where the alpha and beta lines are meeting that particular intersection point becomes much more that means from here then you can step, take the Encke's first equation, second equation and simultaneously the Geringer's equations to evaluate these values velocity etcetera at the next point and you have to go only around the net of the slip lines. So, it is true that uh, the line of velocity discontinuity has to be a slip line. Uh, in some cases discontinuities uh, in the stress field can also occur. Such a discontinuity in uh, stress uh, could be visualized during bend for an example the bending of uh, classical uh, perfectly plastic beam of rectangular section if you remember. If this beam is progressively bent from elastic to plastic state region, the distribution of stress is uh, initially elastic, but as the curvature increases plastic deformation under constant yield shear stress k it spreads inward and ultimately the classic region become uh, vanishing 
when it singly is small as if you refer this figure number 9. So, this is what is being shown here uh, the bending of elastic perfectly plastic beam that the three stages. And uh, now, if you correlate the uh, the physical plane and uh, the this is what is the line of. Uh, so, uh, the stress uh, discontin uh, 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 this contribution uh, therefore, consists of two reason as shown in figure 9 of opposite in nature, which is separated by an extremely narrow a region of uh, elastic or non plastic material. Usually, uh, it is uh, called as the line of stress discontinuity. So, that is how the dis stress discontinuity can be established. So, uh, you see here that that is the stage 2 this is what is the axis in case of the bending of the elastic perfectly plastic beam. And this is what shows the depth the first figure. Now, this is what the reason A and B showing the line of discontinuity here and then the slip line if you plot and this is if you take uh, an element across region A and across region B. So, this particular element will be subjected to uh, along the tangential direction as the uh, sigma x and uh, along the normal direction let us it is sigma y on the region A. So, that is what you recall the point uh, P A and then if it similarly if you take a small uh, corresponding to point P B which is in region B. So, for that element if the stress is uh, recti uh, rectangular stress like uh, similarly the sigma x prime and sigma y prime if we consider and if this is what is being shown the slip lines and this is the angle between them are equal and therefore, uh, if you draw these uh, corresponding to uh, this figure uh, where the physical plane and so these region A and B the corresponding point A and corresponding point B and the, the, the element of the stress. Now, these element of the stress can be represented on a Mohr's circle diagram. So, this stress discontinuity if it is represented uh, in figure 10 as the Mohr's circle diagram. So, if you recall here this particular uh, there are two circles. Now, you see that is one is for more circle for the region A and another on the uh, uh, right side it is the more circle corresponding to region B at point P B. So, the direct stress along x and the shear stress along y. So, if you plot the sigma x sigma y and sigma x prime sigma y prime. So, one can see and that is the angle theta which is the in between uh, the slip lines if you see this is what is the uh, the state of the stress. So, then one can this k is the shear stress of the material. So, the diameter of the circle would represent k because the that is the shear component. 
So, it is now represented as sigma x, sigma y and this stress discontinuity which is represented. So, uh, consider the stresses on either side of uh, the two such uh, line of the stress discontinuity. So, uh, equilibrium of two similar elements one on the either side uh, of the discontinuity as explained and uh, uh, th therefore, the sigma y prime must be equal to sigma y and uh, sigma uh, prime x y must be equal to sigma x uh, x y. It is not necessary for sigma x prime to be equal to sigma uh, x because it is tangential direction. Normal direction must be equal and that, that is in opposite and therefore, it has to be cancelled. These are again from the consideration of cavity formation or peeling off of the material because if the normal directions are not equal, then what will happen? The cavity will be formed or there would be peeling of peeling away of the some material from the surface and, uh, and that will also result into the volume constancy equations to be not true. So, under the situation when the volume is not going to change this uh, uh, normal component of the shear has to be equal and opposite and that will be cancelled out and so there will not be any cavity formation. Let us examine the, uh, the state of stresses in the two region uh, that is uh, in region A and region B. Uh, uh, with the, the help of more circle, uh, the same which is shown here in 10, uh, uh, the direction of maximum shear stress, the plane uh, in the two region appears uh, and therefore, the sigma y prime is equal to sigma y and as said earlier also, sigma uh, prime x y has also to be equal to sigma x y. It is therefore, clear that uh, it is not necessary for the material to be deforming plastically for a stress discontinuity to appear to occur. Uh, now, see here the stress discontinuity axis uh, which is shown uh, and uh, the related axis of symmetry. So, this is what is being shown here in equation uh, 11. So, this axis of symmetry if you look at the point B and point C and point A and this is a point P is here. So, these are the slip lines. So, this is the what is the alpha slip line and this is what is our beta slip line and uh, this is at point C and at the surface at the symmetry axis of symmetry the angle is 45 and therefore, in between it will become 90 degree. So, uh, if it is deforming plastically, then the two Mohr circle will coincide and will interact only at their top or bottom portion. The line of stress discontinuity therefore, can never be a slip line. The Mohr circle indicate that the slip line get reflected at a stress discontinuity since both the circ uh, more circle must be rotated through the same angle to theta for the physical uh, plane to coincide with the direction of maximum shear stress k. Since the slip line get reflected 
at a stress discontinuity, it can be easily shown that the line of discontinuity also gets reflected at 90 degree when it meets the axis of symmetry and that was has been shown here in A11. Uh, so, one can imagine a line of uh, stress discontinuity AB in 11 which is meeting the uh, axis of symmetry at B and reflected through an angle which is psi along BC. The slip line PQ if you see gets reflected at Q on the discontinuity AB through an angle alpha and slip line QR if you see the uh, R is here the point and so uh, the slip line uh, QR gets reflected through an angle beta on BC at R. Since the line of symmetry of uh, uh, since the line of axis of symmetry must be a physical plane slip line PQ and RS being uh, directions of the maximum shear stress must interact the axis at 45 degree and therefore, if you use the triangles that is R B S and B R Q and uh, B Q P one can write down that is ang angle psi is the summation of alpha and beta and psi plus alpha plus beta therefore, must be equal to 180 and therefore, the angle psi which is shown here in figure 11 turns out to be 90 degree. So, this is what is being shown here uh, uh, for a case where the slip line interact at uh, free surface and therefore, uh, uh, corresponding to the free surface uh, if you see here in uh, figure 12 A. Now, this is at the free surface where the alpha and beta line interact here. So, this is what is being shown the free surface alpha line and beta lines and this is what is the angle 45 with the uh, corresponding tangent at the free surface where sigma 1 is 0. Above the free surface sigma 1 is 0 and there is sigma 2 along the free surface line. So, if we take at the point of the free surface a small element which is subjected to two stresses field that is sigma 2 and sigma 1, sigma 1 is 0. Now, look at the figure B part where the again it is shown. where the alpha and beta corresponding to. So, so again here that is under compression and the second one cor corresponds to the tension. So, the boundary condition of stress, stress boundary condition along the slip line becomes very important and it depends on the type of surface. If the, if, if, the, if the point of consideration along the slip line is above uh, uh, at the free surface or within some reason or there is a line of discontinuity. So, the stress boundary condition becomes more important. Some conditions have to be imposed on the angle at which the slip line can inter interact certain boundary condition in order to satisfy the yield criteria therefore. For such boundaries that have been identified we call it as uh, the free surface boundary, we call it as uh, frictionless interface boundary 
we call it as interface with sliding friction boundary and interfaced with sticking friction boundary depending on the situations we come across and uh, we come across the forming processes. So, the free surface is uh, if let us see the free surface boundary condition and uh, when there is a slip uh, line uh, which is uh, at a frictionless interface or the sticking case likewise. So, at any free surface the normal stress is 0 as it is quite obvious. Also, there is no shear stress component along the free surface. Therefore, both normal and tangential directions are the directions of principal stresses which is shown here uh, in uh, uh, figure 12. Since uh, slip lines are uh, directions of maximum shear stress at any point in the deforming material, they must meet the, the free surface at uh, plus minus 45 degree. When sigma 1 and sigma 2 are compressive, the alpha and beta uh, lines as indicated earlier. Uh, so, the sigma 1 is the algebraically greatest principal stress uh, and must lie in the first and the third quadrant. When alpha and beta lines from the right hand coordinate system of the axis. Similarly, when uh, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are tensile in nature as said earlier, sigma 2 become uh, the algebraically greatest principal stress and the directions of alpha and beta lines are interchanged as shown uh, in 12th B. So, this will change the yield criteria requirement. The major principal stress is sigma 2 at the free surface and therefore, it can be evaluated easily. Uh, it can be evaluated using the Mohr circle. Uh, if you recall in figure earlier figure, because sigma 1 and sigma 2 uh, and the free surface uh, sigma uh, 2 becomes twice k which is tensile in nature. For the same situation which is shown uh, earlier in 12th A and uh, then sigma 2 is twice k in case of the compressive stress. For the situation of figure uh, as shown B. So, uh, if you look at this particular figure 13, where the frictionless surface is taken. Now, you look at here, uh, the frictionless for an example, when you are cutting with some tool or if, uh, if, you, are, if you have a deformation because of some uh, indenting or piercing or if there is a some punch is pressing a part of the material. So, you have a tool and there must be a friction interface between the work piece and tool. So, you now you see the figure 13 where the construction of alpha and beta line is shown. So, because uh, this is what is the frictionless in, uh, interface. So, at the interface point the angle 45 is shown here. So, uh, we will continue uh, this lecture further for the different surfaces we come across and how we are going to draw the slip line for different surfaces and using uh, Hanke's first uh, theorem, Hanke's second theorem uh, and uh, the properties of uh, slip lines uh, along with the uh, Geringer's equations 
we can play along with different situations under the these four set of different surfaces and we can find out these stresses anywhere when we draw a network of the slip line for different problems whether you take extrusion problem whether we take wire drying problem wire, uh, 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 rolling problem forging problem one can make the slip line set of slip line net of slip line and one can evaluate at any point the stresses and st and then strain can also be evaluated uh, but please remember that uh, the slip lines are construction, graphical constructions we would again take up later, but uh, these are under uh, plane strain condition. So, uh, if you extend this here the 3 D case it becomes very difficult effort has been made to, uh, but it is very time consuming and as for the other uh, modeling techniques like uh, upper bound uh, and then subsequently finite element method appeared. So, the scope of uh, the slip line is almost gone because of its tediousness and limitation with the situation. So, uh, however, we would continue uh, this lecture uh, uh, in the next one, we, we further and then some of the problem would also be solved. So, once again I would like to thank you for your patience and uh, hopefully you will see so whatever topic we have covered so far, I would request you that you please go ahead with and uh, see the problems if it is uh, the book that list was listed in the very beginning. So, thank you once again and uh, please give your feedback, do not forget to give your feedback because that is what is very important for us to make the things better and better for the future. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>